first film I can dimly remember going to see was Laurence Olivier's Hamlet. Since the film was shot in 1948, I must have been at least six years old. Of course, I saw the film again several times, so I cannot exactly separate what I experienced that first time and what I remember from later viewings. But I precisely remember the theater, already gloomy with its dark paneling, growing darker as the screening began, the majestic lifting of the curtain, and the gloomy images of the castle of Elsinore, surrounded by surging waves accompanied by similarly gloomy music. I also remember that my grandmother, who was with me in the theater that day, told me years later that she was forced to leave with me after less than five minutes because I was screaming in fright at those gloomy images and sounds. Soon after, it must have been the same year as I had not yet started school, I spent three months in Denmark for recreation as part of an aid program for children from countries that had lost the war. It was the first time I was away from home for an extended period and I was miserable. In an effort to cheer me up, my Danish foster parents took me to the movies. It was a murky, rainy, late fall day, cold and cheerless, and the film, the title and plot of which I have forgotten, took place in the jungle and savanna of Africa. Here too I can exactly remember the long, narrow, gloomy theater with doors along the side that opened directly onto the street. The film comprised a number of traveling shots, obviously filmed from inside a jeep, before which fled antelopes, rhinoceroses, and other creatures I'd never seen before. I too was seated in that car, captivated with astonishment and joy. Finally, the film came to an end, and the lights went on. The doors were open to the twilight streets, outside the rain was pouring down, and the noise of traffic filled the theater, and the moviegoers opened their umbrellas and stepped out of the theater. But I was in a state of shock. I could not understand how I, who scant seconds before had been in Africa, in the sun amidst the animals, had been transported back so quickly. How could the theater, which for me had been like a car I was traveling in, had driven back, and especially so quickly, to northern, cold Copenhagen. When I think about the directness and intensity of these first two movie memories, I'm always reminded of those remote tribes to whom shortly after being discovered, that is, shortly after their initial confrontation with so-called civilization, films were shown with a screen and projector set up in the middle of the jungle. According to the projectionist accounts, the savages fled in panic and could barely be calmed down. When they asked the reason for this reaction, they learned after a long, terrified silence that for the natives, the framing of the images was a real mutilation of the people shown in the film, who they perceived as actually being there. For them, the close-up of a head was really the talking, moving, amputated head of a person who was physically present, and who, given such dismembering, should have long been dead. The knowledge of those magical living images with their power to evoke horror and delight equally, has, in a world that accustoms even infants to the constant presence of virtual reality in their living room television set, largely fallen into oblivion. The question remains, to what extent magical fright, to which adults have long become oblivious, can still hold sway over the children's room when the night falls? I had grown up in a world in which television did not yet exist, and in which for the child and in subsequent years, for the youth, visiting one of our small town's three cinemas was always a rare, unusual, and thus precious experience. I don't know to what extent this experience can be conveyed at all to those who were born more recently and have grown up in a world unthinkable without the constant presence of competing floods of images. Years later, during my last year in senior high school, I saw Tony Richardson's screen adaptation of Fielding's Tom Jones. The film relates the eventful story of an orphan boy growing to maturity in 18th century England. It was fast-paced and directed with wit, and it succeeded in its efforts to make the viewer into an accomplice of its fun-loving hero. Suddenly, perhaps a third of the way into the film, in the middle of a breathtaking chase sequence, the protagonist stopped in his tracks, looked into the camera, that is, at me, and before resuming his flight from his pursuers, commented on the difficulty of his predicament, thereby making me aware of mine. 
The shock of recognition of this moment was in every way equal to the terror of my childhood movie experiences. Naturally, I had long since grasped that the movies were not real. Naturally, I had long since distanced myself physically and probably mentally by ironic observations from the unnerving immediacy of a thriller's virtuality. But never before this shocking discovery of my constant complicity with film protagonists had I experienced the dizzying immediacy that separates fiction and reality. Never before had I physically experienced to what extent I and my fellow humans, that is, the audience, were largely victims and not partners of those whom we paid to entertain us. Of course, I know what the power of living images could achieve when put in the service of ideologies, but this knowledge was little more than abstract and, like anything abstract, merely prevented direct experience. Weeks later, I remembered those initial movie-going experiences whose overwhelming effect, whose fright and joy, I had long since repressed. I had looked behind the mirror and began to see the cinema with different eyes, to distrust those storytellers who pretended to render unbroken reality. Nonetheless, my hunger for stories was not sated. I wasn't sure what I was looking for in the movies. It was no doubt a form of film art that still offered the experience of being directly touched, the wonderful enchantment of the films of my childhood, but which did not thereby turn me into the helpless victim of the story being told and its teller. That I, in 1967, while already a university student, was able to see Bresson's film at all, if it screened publicly, it did so to no publicity. I owe to a film course at our university that gave students the opportunity to become familiar with some of the films that, as uncommercial artworks, were very unlikely to reach our theaters. The film crashed into our seminar like a UFO fallen from a distant planet and divided us into fanatic supporters and fierce opponents. Provocative, foreign, and surprising, the film broke with all the golden rules of mainstream cinema on both sides of the wide ocean as well as with those of so-called European art film, and was at the same time uncannily perfect in its absolute unity of content and form. I grasped only later that this perfection had its own story of maturation behind it when I had the opportunity to see Bresson's previous films. Nonetheless, and despite the masterpieces that came after it, O Hazar Balthazar remains for me the most precious of all cinematic jewels. No other film has ever made my heart and my head spin like this one. What was and what is so special about it? What does the film tell? Balthazar is a donkey. The film tells the story of his life, his suffering and his death. And it tells, in fragments, the story of those who cross Balthazar's path. The beginning, the screen still dark, before the fading of the first image, the tinkling of the bells of a herd of sheep. Then the first shot, close up, the baby donkey drinks from between its mother's legs. In the background, we sense the herd of sheep more than we see it. Only their bells are heard ringing softly and serenely. Then a child's skinny arm wraps itself around the animal's neck, tugs it away from its mother. The camera pans along and we see the little girl tenderly hugging the donkey. A boy about the same age bending over and patting it and between them in the background, a man. They are all dressed lightly, it is summer. Long shot. The children are running beside their father, who is pulling the little donkey behind him down into the valley from the mountain pasture. The sheep's bells have fallen silent. Close up. With a small pitcher, one of the children pours water over the donkey's head and says, Balthazar, je te baptise au nom du Père, et du Fils, et du Saint-Esprit. Ainsi soit-il. The ending. Balthazar carries the loot of a pair of smugglers. They were going over the border in the mountains. It's night. Suddenly, the don't move of a border guard. The smugglers run back the way they came. As we hear shots, the camera lingers on Balthazar's face. Then he, too, takes off downhill in the direction where his masters, who tormented him constantly, have just fled. Daylight. Balthazar is standing quietly between the pine trees on the mountain. Close up. 
His shoulder. Blood is seeping from a bullet wound. He begins to move, wanders out from under the sheltering trees into the pristine alpine pastures, still burdened with the smuggler's loot on his shoulders. The bells of a herd. We see sheep approaching. Black sheepdogs jump around them, barking, the bells ringing. A shepherd. Individual dogs. Then the herd stands around Balthazar. We can barely make him out through all the sheep surrounding him. We hear the bells from up close. The black dogs. The sheep begin to move off, slowly revealing the donkey, who is now sitting on the ground. Again the dogs. Then the sheep have retreated into the background. Balthazar in the foreground. The music comes in. The deeply sad Andantino from Schubert's A Major Sonata which has accompanied Balthazar's life story through the film, offering pity and at the same time consolation. Slowly, very slowly, Balthazar head sinks, then completely filling the frame, only the herd. It is in motion, leads us back to Balthazar, who is lying there, stretched out on the grassy pasture, not moving anymore. The music stops, only the sound of the bells. The sheep wander off into the background, disappearing into the mountain landscape. In the foreground, Balthasar is dead. The bells become softer. The end. In between lies a life that, in its sad simplicity, stands for those of millions. A life of small pleasures and great efforts, banal, unsentimental, and because of its depressing ordinariness apparently unsuitable for exploitation on the silver screen. In fact, the film is not about anyone, and thus about everyone. A donkey has no psychology, only a destiny. The title is the precise reflection of the film's intention. By chance, for instance, Balthazar. It could be anyone else, you or I. Brissant chose the name, he says, for its alliteration. That sounds arbitrary, like a platitude, but is actually just the opposite. Brisson's model theory, his rigorous rejection of professional actors in favor of aptly chosen amateurs, has often been discussed and still more often criticized. It is also what prevented his film's financial success. Here in Balthazar, the motive for this theory shapes up most clearly and coherently. The screen hero is not a character who invites us to identify with him, who experiences emotions for us that we are allowed to feel vicariously. Instead, he is a projection screen, a blank sheet of paper whose sole task is to be filled with the viewer's thoughts and feelings. The donkey does not pretend to be sad or to suffer when life is hard on him. It is not he who cries, it is us, for an icon of imposed forbearance precisely because he is not like an actor peddling his ability to exteriorize emotion. The animal Balthazar, along with the knights in the director's later Lancelot of the Lake, locked up in their clattering suits of armor to the point of being unrecognizable, are Brisson's most convincing models, simply because they are by definition unable to pretend. Not that Brisson's model concept has always worked well. Amateurs can be cast just as inappropriately as actors. The otherwise wonderful Trial of Joan of Arc, for example, suffers from its protagonist's lack of charisma. That notwithstanding, the non-acting of his always painstakingly, even lovingly chosen amateurs, the monotony of their manner of talking and moving, their presence reduced to mere existence, was and is a liberating experience far more than the casual naturalness of the young actors and the cerebral fireworks and intellectual jokes of his younger colleague, Godard. It gave back to the people in front of the camera their dignity. No one had to pretend anymore to make visible emotions that, because acted, could only be a lie anyway. It had always struck me as obscene to watch an actor portray, with dramatic fury, someone suffering or dying. It robbed those who were truly suffering and dying of their last possession, the truth, and it robbed the viewers of this professional reproduction of their most precious possession as viewers, their imagination. 
they were forced into the humiliating perspective of a voyeur at the keyhole who has no choice but to feel what is being felt before him and think what is being thought. Cinema has missed out on the opportunity it has, new in comparison with literature, to represent reality as a total sensory impression, to develop forms that maintain and even for the first time enable the necessary dialogue between a work of art and its recipient. The lie that pretense is reality has become the trademark of cinema, one of the most profitable in the annals of industry. One senses in Balthazar, as in all of Brisson's films, its author's almost physical aversion to any type of lie, especially to any form of aesthetic pretense. This passionate aversion appears to be the driving force behind his entire oeuvre. It leads to a purity of narrative means unique in the history of cinema. While reading the description of the beginning and end of the film, for a reader unfamiliar with Bresson's films, the impression may creep in of poetry, affected beauty, or pretentious stylization. There is none of that in the film. Documentary, simplicity in framing, an almost manic rejection of beautiful, that is, pleasing images, as were occasionally to be found in his earliest films, and as are dominating today's art cinema, as well as American ape pictures and TV advertising. Indeed, one could venture on to say that Brisson invented the dirty image in the field of art cinema, alongside the ever palpable desire to show things as clearly and simply as possible, an infallible instinct saves him from the danger of sterile stylization. For all the precision of their framing, his pictures always give the impression of being frayed, open and ready for when the reality breaks the rules. Herein lies the source, I think, of his well-known conflicts with his cameramen such as De Santis, all famous for the beauty of their images. Precision rather than beauty. Each shot shows only what is absolutely essential. Each sequence has been compressed to its most concise form in briefest duration possible. Even so, the length of the shots and cuts are, even for the period when the film was made, in 1965, unusually calm. Never do pauses create room for sentimentality, in its simplicity everything gives the impression of having been developed naturally, and, while being in the service of a rigorous aesthetic concept, is never the victim of the latter. Rassan reportedly intended to personify the seven deadly sins in his characters, but against a declaration such as this, can be placed a sentence from his notes on the cinematographer. Hide the ideas, but in such a way that they can be found. The most important will be the best hidden. And at another spot he writes, production of emotion obtained by resistance to emotion. And emotion will emerge from a mechanics, from the compulsion towards a mechanical regularity. In support, he cites the pianism of Lipati, a great pianist, not a virtuoso, one like Lipati, relentlessly hits the notes the same way, half notes, the same duration, the same intensity, fourth notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, etc. He doesn't pound the emotion into the keys, he waits for it, it comes and takes over his fingers, the piano, him, the concert hall. What does this mean for the film? One example, the village teacher, who has been dealt a rough blow, both through his own pride and through the malice of others, dies, still young, without having been ill. How is this being told? The teacher's wife shows the priest into the house. When opening the door to the teacher's room, she says, Il est désespéré. Lui le coeur. The priest goes through the door into the room. The teacher in his bed turns toward the wall. The priest doesn't know what to say. Then he sees the teacher's table with the Bible, goes to get it, and sitting down and opening it, says, Il faut pardonner à tous. À vous, il sera beaucoup pardonné à cause de vos souffrances. The teacher turned away. Je souffre peut-être moins que vous ne pensez. The priest leaves through the Bible, finds something, reads it to the teacher. Car le Seigneur ne rejette pas à toujours. Mais lorsqu'il afflige, il a compassion selon sa grande miséricorde, car ce n'est pas volontiers qu'il humilie et qu'il afflige les enfants des hommes.
The teacher's wife had stopped at the partly open door. Now she turns away, steps in front of the house, sits on the bench at the door, and says, Mon Dieu, ne me l'enlevez pas lui aussi. Attendez. Vous savez combien ma vie sera triste et douloureuse. Knocks on the inside of the window. The wife looks. The hand behind the window disappears gradually. The wife gets up, goes inside. She enters the teacher's room. The camera follows her to his bed. Standing up, her torso blocks the view onto his upper body. We only see his hands. As he lies on his back, they lie still on both sides of his body. The woman kneels down, holds the man's hands, off screen the priest's voice. Ego de absolvo peccatis tuis in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. The woman leans forward to kiss her husband's hands. Quick dissolve. The woman is sitting in the garden next to a tree. We see her from behind. She has put her face into her hands. The whole sequence takes less than two and a half minutes. The lines are spoken quickly and without emotion. The characters move with the monotony of marionettes. No motion is driven by emotion. No tear relieves the pent-up sorrow. And yet, or precisely because of this, do we as viewers sense the depth of despair in all characters more strongly than in any melodrama that pulls our heartstrings? All actions and events retain the polyvalence of real life. The author never takes sides. The spectator is always called upon to use his own personal judgment, free to choose, to find his own truth and interpretation. The priest's efforts to console find their counterpart in his insecurity and in the rigidification of the rites and phrases at his disposal. The teacher's despair stands in contrast to his pride that has devolved into hubris. The wife's fear to her passive suffering and vis-à-vis -vis all the neediness and misery there is the indifference or non-existence of a god who, when asked to grant life, imposes or permits death. The polyvalence of plot and motifs creates distance. The often repeated charge is that Bresson makes it difficult for the viewer and that he prevents the possibility of identification and that his films are cold, arrogantly elitist and pessimistic. With regard to the latter charge, he responded to an interviewer. We were confusing pessimism with clarity and he went on to say, take Greek tragedy, is that pessimism? I have a videotape of the awards ceremony from the 1983 Cannes Film Festival, where the Golden Palm was awarded jointly to the then 76-year-old Bresson for his last film, L'Argent, and to Andrei Tarkovsky for Nostalgia. As Bresson, called up by Orson Welles, stepped onto the stage, a tumult broke out, a furious acoustic battle between those booing and those acclaiming him. The audience was asked for a calm a number of times. Only as Tarkovsky was invited on stage did the storm of protest abate. Himself an open admirer of Bresson, Tarkovsky may not have been happy with this. What he had extolted about the films of his idol was precisely their independence from audience tastes, for which Bresson was now being booed before his eyes, while he, who had likewise been vilified as a hermeticist, was being cheered. What then is so different about his way of using image and sound that Bresson found it necessary to resurrect for himself a term that had fallen into disuse, cinematograph, because he no longer found a common language and a common meaning with that which is called and calls itself cinema. A decade before Al Hazard Balthazar was made, Adorno wrote in his essay form and content in the contemporary novel with regard to Kafka. His novels, if they still at all fall under that category, are prolegomena to a condition of the world in which the contemplative attitude has become bloody mockery, because the permanent threat of catastrophe no longer permits anyone to look on passively or to tolerate the aesthetic result of such passivity, and elsewhere referring to Dostoevsky no modern work of art worthy of the name that would not take pleasure in the dissonant and the unbound, but inasmuch as such works of art embody terror uncompromisingly and invest all the bliss of observation in the purity of such expression, they serve freedom, 
which mediocre works only betray. The illusion that reality can be depicted in an artifact rather than being only an agreement between the artist and his recipient had, since it had been questioned by Nietzsche, become obsolete at the very latest since the incommensurable horrors of the Nazi reign. The Holocaust and the World War for everyone who sought to participate even somewhat consciously in this field of activity. The verdict that no more poems could be written after Auschwitz demarcated the horizon of consciousness of the survivors and future generations as much as did the retraction of the Ninth Symphony together with all of Western culture in Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus. In German-speaking countries, the protruded inheritors of guilt seized with wide eyes on the analysis of those words and signs that had turned out to be so corruptible. But even beyond the German language, the fate in a solid and also stable relationship between art and its reception was dealt a blow at once devastating and productive. Only the cinema, the most expensive form of artificial communication, and the one most dependent on money, firmly withstood every reflective renewal. The new subjects, positions, or putative findings were presented in the old, long-compromised forms, and the supposed distinction between the most presumptuously self-assured and aestheticizing schmaltz of right, as well as left-wing provenance and the so-called progressive art film, remained but a self-justifying farce of the artists and actors who live off the film industry. For the contents and crises of meaning of a shattered world, new forms had to be found on behalf of the financiers that betrayed these contents by making them fit for consumption, otherwise the films would not be made. Naturally, such forms were found, they were refined and compiled, and in the course of this process, the majority of those involved forgot why they had been undertaken in the first place. A polemic oversimplification? I think this is required in order to express why Bresson, the scandal monger, was and is such a provocation in the world of moving pictures. In order to be and to remain active in the feature film world, to avoid the term film business, even those who saw through and despised the rules of the game described above found themselves forced to subscribe to them, even to place themselves in their service. To what extent they did so while consciously distancing themselves from them, or were influenced unconsciously by them, is visible in their attempts to playfully circumvent these rules of the game. The strategies that film-producing countries of the so-called free world deployed to circumvent the rules differed from those of totalitarian countries only through their semantics. If individual works strayed from the unbroken agreement, which had been restored due to economic pressure, Namely, their artistic inconsistency was a result of exigencies. They were panned, shortened, re-edited, castrated, regarded as a faux pas of their makers, relegated to the realm of the experimental film, and thus no threat to the market, or at best half-heartedly tolerated by certain critics as exceptions that prove the rule. The most exciting and most truthful of what international cinema has to offer can be found in this category of exceptions. Pasolini's Salo, Tarkovsky's Mirror, a few films by Ozu, Rossellini, Antonioni, and Renan, Klug's Artists, Straub's Chronic, and a handful of others. What happens in them? The films are as different as their authors and the cultural circles from which they originated. What they have in common, and what differentiates them from the great mass of film production, and even from other films by the same author, is their successful unity of content and form. It shatters the dubious consent between representer and represented, and, like the optical torture chair in Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, prevents us from closing our eyes and forces us to gaze in the mirror. What a sight! The horror! Spectators accustomed to and luxuriously accommodated within the lies, leave the theater aghast, starved for a language capable of capturing the traces of life, and with hearts and minds suddenly opened, the remaining spectators wait for a continuation of the stroke of luck that had unexpectedly taken place. Few of the above-mentioned authors achieved more than once this unity of what is depicted and how it is depicted. 
they found their way back to more easily trodden paths. The storm warnings of failure must be heeded, the fidelity of one's fans rewarded, and the bigger the following, the wider and more well-worn the path. But it's the builders of freeways who earn the most. In such a context, Bresson's continuity seems almost miraculous. After his two and a half tentative first steps, which already contain the thematic catalog of his later works, a short public affairs, and his two features, Angels of Sin and La Dame de Bois de Bologne, his formal vocabulary is fully developed with The Diary of a Country Priest in 1950, and he remains unwaveringly committed to it for the duration of his output, another 10 films in 33 years. Of almost all the great auteurs, it is said that in all their works they have always made the same film over and over. Of none is this so accurate as Aubresson. To be addicted to truth, indeed, this leaves no choice. Do not think of your film beyond the means that you have chosen for yourself, he writes in his notes. And indeed, it is impossible to tell while watching his films if the means have determined the content or the other way around. They are so very much one and the same. Their unity leaves no room for ideology or interpretation of the world, commentary or consolation. Everything dissolves into pure relationality and it is up to the viewer to draw conclusions from the sum of the arrangements. Reduction and omission become the magic keys to activating the viewer. In this respect, it is precisely the hermetic aspects of Bresson's oeuvre that seek to make the spectator's role easier. It takes him seriously. What is omitted is the gesture of persuasion of models that invite emotional identification. What is omitted is the all too coherent meaning of the explanatory context of psychology and sociology. As in our daily experience, chance and contradiction of fragmentary splinters of action demand their rights and our attention. What is omitted is the pretense of any kind of wholeness, including that of man's representation. The torso and the extremities come together only for fleeting moments. They are separated, set equal to objects and at their mercy. The face becomes one part among many, a motionless, expressionless icon of melancholy for the loss of identity. What is omitted is the unusual because it would defraud the misery of everyday existence of its dignity. What is omitted, finally, is happiness, because its depiction would desecrate suffering and pain. And it is precisely this universal retraction, not so unlike that of Mons Faustus, this tender respect for people's capacity for perception and personal responsibility, that harbor in their gesture of refusal more utopia than all the bastions of repression and cheap consolation. The unity of content and form redeems a premonition of the interrelation of meaning that has been lost to the described world. In leaving out the portrayal of happiness, wishing grows wings, and for the happy moment of viewing, pain is caught in its own icon.